I met today's guest under pretty cool circumstances. Picture the sit-down dinner of the Diageo World Class UK Finals, one of the hardest cocktail competitions in the country. There were 11 finalists and each table of 10 was served by one of the competitors for the night. My table was served by a senior bartender of the American Bar of the Savoy Hotel. It's tough to get better than that. I'm Susan Schwartz, your drinking companion, and this is Lush Life Podcast. Every week, we are inspired to live life one cocktail at a time by the best in the industry. Who knew that under that sharp white jacket and smooth persona... Martin Hudek of Maybe Sammy in Sydney and global coffee ambassador of Mr. Black had a passion like no other for coffee and coffee cocktails. He kept it under wraps until winning the World Coffee and Good Spirits Award in 2017. Since then, he's gone on to move to Australia, open an award-winning bar of his own and win the International Bartender of the Year. Through the miracle of modern science, I was able to interview him in Australia and discover what led him to go down under and how his coffee loving became spiritual. Before we begin, you can find links on how to donate to some of your favorite bars during this rough time on the homepage of my website, alushlifemanual.com. Now, it's time to hear from Martin. Do you know that I have known you for almost three years, which is crazy because we met when you were at the final of the world class UK Diageo and you were our, our bartender for the night. Oh and my I like, God. Isn't that crazy? And you know what? I realized that even though you're my friend, I consider you a friend because I've known you for so long. I know absolutely nothing about you except for you have a beard now. You live in Australia. You're the global brand ambassador for Mr. Black. And you've done at maybe same, you've done won all these awards. So I want to know how you got there. So why don't you tell me a little bit about your upbringing and uh, where you grew up and we'll go from there. Yeah, cool. That's true, Susan. Like uh, it's been, yeah, 2017, uh, June, June 2017. Remember that? Yeah, <laughs> it was a beautiful time. It's a long time ago, but uh, it's true. We know each other since then. And uh uh, that year was one of the most uh, unforgettable one, but I'll get to that uh, any minute soon. So I started, uh, <laughs> I started with my origin because many people are confused by my accent. You know, they are like, "Oh, you must be Nordic or Swedish," because even the way they look at me, you know, like blue eyes, blonde hair, and even uh, in Australia, people are confused. Um, but my origin is uh, Central Europe, Slovakia. Uh, for uh, for other friends which are not familiar with Slovakia, maybe Czechoslovakia might come up in their minds, but basically Central Europe or Eastern Europe. Um, working uh, working um, in hospitality for more than ten years, uh, studying university or a culinary school, where uh, you, you learn about all topics, you know, from the kitchen to the restaurant to the bar, barista, uh, reception, basically everything. And I graduated as a chef and uh, with diploma as a chef. And to be honest, right after I finished my studies in 2008, 9, 10, I was like, good, I'm going to the kitchen, obviously. I should be in the kitchen. Uh, and I hate it so much that after three weeks, I went to the pharmacy and uh, I bought this fake bandage for my arm to look like my arm is broken. So I put it on my arm and I went to work. I was like, oh, guys, sorry, I had an accident. I broke my arm. I can't work in the kitchen anymore. Uh, you're going to pay me some, <laughs> some money because now I'm on a, on a, a sick leave. And I left kitchen forever since, for the reason you're a I, naughty boy. Yeah, well, I was, Wait, and I was, by the way, by the way, you're going way too fast. We got to go back a little, okay? Because already you're like practically in London, okay? So, grew up in Slovakia. Yeah. Um, did you always want to do hospitality? Was that something that you uh, no. were dreaming about? No, no, I was dreaming to do uh, uh, musicals and uh, and uh, TV shows and uh, basically doing anything what is around the art. So I'm a very artistic person. I, uh, I had a band for like five years. I was lead singer. I did, uh, I did some TV, TV shows like The Voice or X Factor in some countries they call it. Uh, I made it to almost the semifinals. I was in national TV. Um, then I went for some uh, uh, like musical uh, uh, events and I tried to get the role. Um, I, I, I applied for um, art school 
painting school. But my parents were like, nah, you shouldn't do it. You know, it's not a safe job uh, in our country. The artists, they're not earning money. You should do something, but you're going to have paper from, and that's culinary school. And I did that. I got that paper. And once you have this paper in Slovakia, it's pretty easy to find a job because you have like a stamp. Yes, you know how to cook. But in Slovakia, when I was cooking, you know, for those three weeks, I hated it so much, you know, because... Now, I have a question. There's a lot of things that you can do. Um, where, had you cooked before at home? Did you make drinks nah. at home? Nah, no, it was just all. like something to do? Something to do. Like I was I was interested in coffee and cocktails, obviously, but in this kind of naive junior level, you know, at school doing this sort of uh, IBA competitions, you know, following the rules and, you know, those six color drinks with big garnishes. And I was pretty successful at school. And you know? I was like one of the best baristas and bartenders at school. But it's easy because like it's cool, right? It's not a real life. But once you step out, of this uh, naive junior uh, competition life and you walk into the reality of everyday job and then you realize the competition is there you know your guest you know that they want something what you don't know how to do it and etc it was real challenge so right after studies yeah. because i didn't w- wanted to work in the kitchen i started working in a local cafe so in my hometown i was working in a local coffee shop and in slovakia coffee shops are not famous for making cocktails or drinks you know like you're serving coffee from the morning till night people drinking wine maybe some spritzes mostly hard spirits eau de vies and beers and uh of course like i had this dream to do cocktails and do martinis and negronis and my own creations but no one drink that you know in my part of the country and and i was in that little coffee shop for almost almost five years and I always had this dream that one day this city is going to be small for me and I want to grow up and challenge myself and go somewhere, you know, go somewhere where I can uh, really, really see how bad or good I am. And in those five years in Slovakia, like, I became like one of the top Slovakian bartenders, which is easy because like 10 of us, you know, back home. Were you still in that little town? Yeah, I was still in the little town and our capital city, Bratislava, was on the other side and I was always traveling there for competitions and I won a couple of them, you know, I went to Cuba I went to Sweden. I went to so many places because I was one of the best in Slovakia. But again, it was very easy. It was a kind of naive way of being like, yeah, I'm the best in my country. But I had this I had this kind of idea. It's time for change. It's time for another challenge. And that's when London came up into my mind and changed my life completely. Had you been to London before with one of the competitions? Never. Never. Apparently, I won a, I won beef eater competition, and the, the prize was uh, finals in London. But meantime, I was supposed to go there for finals. I moved there, and I started my new career. So did you pick London because you just thought this is the center of cocktail creation right now? Exactly. It was, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it was a mecca of cocktails, and it still is. And, uh, and I took as well advantage of having many friends there. As we know, Czechoslovakian community is very big around the world, especially London. In every big bar, back in time, you had some Czech or Slovak. And I was relying on the fact that if I'm going to text them and be like, hey, I'm thinking to move and take another challenge in my life, would you recommend me something? So I sent a couple of messages to the big names, you know, like Alex Kratena, Marian Becke, Rusty Servan, et cetera, et cetera. And one of them was, of course, Eric Lawrence. And uh, I didn't expect any answer. Uh, but uh, probably one of the most busiest guy on the earth, Eric Lawrence, he responded to me in 35 minutes. Uh, oh and, he, and he was like, yeah, I might have something for you. I was like, oh, cool. So maybe some little coffee shop next door, or maybe I can be like a bar bag or kitchen port at the Savoy. And he was like, well, actually, I don't know if, if you know, but Tom Walker, Bacardi Legacy winner, he's leaving. And uh, we're looking for replacing. We're looking for senior bartender. I was like, Pfft what's that <laughs> impossible i can apply for that job i don't even speak english and i don't even know what is bacardi legacy competition for example um and like and and he said like would you be interested i was like well okay i'll try so for those of you listening right now if you think to get job at the savoy it's like very easy <laughs> and just for knowing uh, someone like eric and being from the same country like him, it's kind of advantage. It's not. Uh, Eric just recommend me and put my name on the list from many, many other people. And I went wait, wait, wait. The- question, question. Yeah. Um, had you ever met him personally? Uh, I, I met him five years before or three years before in Slovakia, where I won the local award for uh, like a like a young rookie rookie of the year, like superstar of the year, a young talent. And he gave me this trophy. And then funny enough that. <laughs> That uh, 
that like the, the trophy thing happened again last year in December in Shanghai, but we'll get to that. Uh, but I met him like once or twice. And I met him once in Prague with Peter Dorelli. They were doing some presentation. And I made and I make a picture with Peter Dorelli, Eric, and me. And that was in 2014. And when I posted on Facebook, I, I wrote a, I wrote a status that uh, the uh, past, present, and then future. You know, with question oh, you had mark. a big ego, big ego. Well, well, it was like kind of, you know, question mark. You know, I was like, I like, love that. It's a good thing. <laughs> it was like hoping for that, you know, hoping. I had this kind of dream, you know, to be next to them and work with them. So, yeah, I met Eric, but we, I wouldn't call him friend or someone mm -hmm. he knows me or something like that. So, yeah, he put my name there. And uh, that was like Friday, I think. And Sunday, I did the uh, first part of the uh hiring process which was the online so literally two days later yeah i did psychological test which is uh through the online agency through the, from the us and it's 60 questions uh each question is like 30 seconds and it's more about your uh charisma character who you are as a personality it was personality test nothing about bartending questions like it's true that you, you have a tidy house yes no i don't know etc and then question 55 you walk to the room and there is a paper on the floor. What would you do? You pick it up or you leave it, you ignore it, okay. etc. So like they're testing you, you know, what kind of persona are you? And then on Tuesday, Eric texts me and he was like, congratulations, you passed psychological test. You are a right fit and personality for American Bar. Now, would you like to come for a personal interview in London? And I was like, oh my God, I've never been in London. Uh, uh, yes, I would like to come. And he was like, so when? I was like, I'll come tomorrow. So... <laughs> I booked the flight tickets on Tuesday, like super expensive flight tickets. And day after on Wednesday, I came to London, clean shaved, bleeding from my neck because I didn't know how to clean. I borrowed a tie from my cousin, jacket from my father. I got lost. I didn't know how to get there from Trafalgar Square. I didn't know which direction uh, on a Strand Street. I came late and I was like so stressed. And then um, Eric just showed me the bar manager, Declan McGurk, still bar manager and bar operator at the Savoy. And then uh, he introduced me to him. He took me to the office, this little tiny office in HR. And I had an interview with him, with HR people, then interview with the food and beverage director, and three different people. And again, like almost nothing about cocktails. Like I was getting ready, you know, like learning all the classic drinks about sour cocktail book and everything. And it was more about like personality. And uh, it was mm -hmm. weird. And I remember well, I when guess I I guess they just assume that, you know, you've already been in competitions, you know how to make a cocktail. You know, it's really, can you get along with us who've been here for a while? And are you, you know, uh, so avoid so worthy, I guess. Yeah. And I remember when Declan asked me like, okay, so now we are done. If we would go downstairs, what kind of drink would you like to have? And I was like, uh, I will have orange juice or water because like, you know, I was reading about interviews, how you should behave, what you should say. I was like, oh, come on, you're a bartender, what you want? And I said, like, I want to like to have a Moonwalk cocktail because that's the classiest drink from 1969 by Joe Gearmore, dedicated to moon landing and it's kind of celebratory champagne drink. And I remember I sat there in the bar for like three hours, sipping this one drink, enjoying every sip. And I was so nervous and hang hungry that I ate like three snack trays and uh, it was an unforgettable moment. And Day after, I flew back to Slovakia. My phone went off charge. I didn't have a battery. I got lost. I couldn't get to the airport. I was just like, oh my God, it was such a hard time. And I got back day after to Slovakia Thursday. I was working in a little cafe. And I had the last phone call from uh, GM of the hotel. He was in US uh, for some work trip. So through the phone, I had to convince him I'm the right guy. He was like a last, you know, like stamp. Yes, he's the right guy. And then Friday, 13th of November, 2014, it was 11.35 in the morning. I was in the car on the way to Prague to Czech Republic for coffee festival. And I got a message from Eric. Congratulations. Welcome in the best bar team in the world. And Amazing. I cried like a baby. I cried like a baby. And a uh, month later, 10th of December, 2014, it was Wednesday, 4.30 afternoon. I did my first shift at the American bar as a senior bartender. Now, I heard an urban myth, and I don't know if it's true or not, that I read that the first martini you ever made was at the Savoy, your first shift. Is that really true? Yeah, probably it is true. First real martini by someone who ordered it, it was at the Savoy. So no one had ever ordered a martini at the cafe where you worked before? No, people were drinking straight gin, like 100 ml, you know, like triple shots like this, straight gin and beer. <laughs> and do, you, do, you, do you remember any of the cocktails that you had made before at home? 
Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, uh, passion fruit martini and French French uh, <laughs> French martini and uh, pina coladas and mojitos. I did like three hundred mojitos a night. Oh <laughs> so, my goodness! Yeah, <laughs> it must have been like <laughs> a. a a vacation from making mojitos at the Savoy, like, oh, woo, I don't have to make so many a night now. Well, we did time to time, like people think, still think about the Savoy, it's uh, such a classic bar, and, but we had the moments where we did like, you know, Long Island iced teas and mojitos and strawberry virgin daiquiris, you know, there were moments where you were like, oh, wow, it's really happening even here, you know? Oh my God, I love it, a strawberry virgin daiquiri at the Savoy. <laughs> True thing. <laughs> so was it everything that you thought it would be and more? When you got it there? Was, it was way more than I thought. It was so overwhelming. It was like unbelievable, breathtaking every moment, uh, especially beginning. It was something I never experienced in my life. It was way bigger than me, way bigger than I thought. It was it was new new life. I never been outside of my home. You know, I never left my country for a long time, never left my family for such a long time. And uh, it wasn't only a uh, uh, life changing experience in terms of the bar and work, but it was life changing experience because of, because of who I became, you know, it changed me as a person. You know, I think I grew up a lot and I changed a lot as a person, not only as a bartender, but as a person. And one of the reasons was not only working at the Savoy and carrying the history and legacy on your shoulder, but working with people such as Eric and Zeklan and other amazing bartenders alongside like Joe Schofield, uh, Lawrence Antinori, etc. But on top of that, I was able to even having opportunity to live with Eric. You know, we lived in the same house for more than two years. So he took me really under his wings. And many times after work, we took the same bus back home for like one hour and a half and talking. We came home, we opened a bottle of mezcal. We were eating traditional Slovakian food at 4 a.m. in the morning, talking about life. And and then I had those moments in the life when I was about to go out for like a special occasion, like let's say some bartender competition or gathering. And I didn't even know how to wear a jacket you know what is a double breasted what is single breasted jacket on how to tie a tie you know like what kind of shoes i should wear and everything eric taught me you know about about the life how to become a real man and gentleman and that's unbelievable well he obviously must have seen a little bit of himself in you having been from the same country and you know when he got to london he didn't speak english at all either and I'm surprised you speak English as well as you do, having lived with him, because I'm sure you just spoke Slovakian, right? Well, it's, that's not true. Uh, that's not true. Uh, All right. that, that first day, 10 of December, when I walked to the back room of the Savoy of the American Bar, I opened the door and I was so stressed and sweaty. Uh, and, I, and I locked out myself from the locker and I didn't. I didn't know the password and I just like opened the door. I was like, Eric, Eric. And I started speaking Slovakian. Like, Eric, I forgot my password. Can you help me? And look at me with his, you know, like his eyes. You know, he's like very strict. And it was like, only in English from now on. And I was like, oh, oh. good for him. And I was like, wow. No matter what, it doesn't matter if we're from the same country, living together. He was so hard on me and equally hard on everyone else. And he didn't cut any corners. And he gave me the hardest lesson at work. And it was just absolutely amazing to see that attitude towards me. And even we were outside of work, we speak English sometimes. And Eric is one of those people which I really appreciate a lot. As soon as we are in company, other person, which is not speaking our language, he, he's straight away switching to English because he respect them. There are many other mm -hmm. bartenders, and I can witness that even nowadays, where I'm working, uh, you know, like majority of my colleagues are Italians, you know, and they're gonna speak Italian between each other. And I do understand sometimes, sometimes not, but this would never happen in the Savoy, never, because the English is the language of the Savoy. Mm -hmm. Now, while we, I know that you have a passion for coffee, and you've always had a passion for coffee. While you were at the Savoy, were you able to, um, I don't know, delve into that passion or use it at the Savoy? Were they open to doing any coffee cocktails or anything like that? Like they knew that I'm passionate about coffee. They knew I want to do competitions and they knew my background. And uh, unfortunately, I couldn't, you know, like although they trust my taste and my opinions, I couldn't because it's such a big company, you know, like to have a to have a something sign in, sign off, you know, like and approved. You need to wait months, you know, and it's procedure. And uh, unfortunately, it didn't work out, and uh, I, I couldn't deliver my coffee passion on the level as I wished to. Uh, but funny enough, I was at the Savoy uh, more than a month ago. I was there in March, actually. 
and I went to the Savoy, went to the American bar afternoon for a coffee. And uh, they changed the coffee and they used one of the best roasteries in London. They were one of the best coffee machines in town. And the change happened. It just happened after me. And that legacy of me and my opinion for uh, quality coffee was still there. And I'm very happy they, they changed it. And uh, yes, it's one of the most historical places in, in Europe. But uh, I'm so happy they are able to admit that the change is here and right now and they have to change something so i'm very happy were, well were you able to do that on the side while yes. you were working or was yes yeah. I, w- I was doing lots of side projects with the uh, local uh, cafes and roasteries i was doing lots of competitions you know attending coffee festivals and still trying like to you know like tell everyone how, how coffee is important and talk about importance of good coffee and cocktails and how to bridge that gap and and then it it basically uh evolved in 2017 when i became a world coffee and spirit champion so there was kind of like a final you know like uh winning approval that yes i won this competition i know how to do the best coffee cocktails in the world and uh, i achieved this uh, award okay well let's talk about the regression up to that award because i know that wasn't your first time trying <laughs> and um how many times did you try so i was competing for seven years in the national seven finals times. in slovakia yeah so seven times in national finals, first three years I was disqualified because I was so stubborn and full of ego and myself that I was thinking that if I'm going to rock up for a coffee competition like bartender with that bartender attitude of leather apron and music and dry eyes and bow tie, I'm going to be the best. Of course, I was five times, five minutes over time, so I was disqualified, you know. Uh, second time, second year, I didn't read the rules, I did the mistake, disqualified. You know, and so on, so on. And then 2013, I, be- I won the Slovakian finals. Became sixth in the world in France. Year after, became second in the world in in Melbourne, Australia, and then 2016 in uh, in Shanghai, in China. You know, it was my third time in the world finals. I was already kind of like well known in the coffee world, and people were telling me, "Yeah, hey, number three is a lucky number. You're gonna win. You're the best." You know, year before, just ten points, and I was like, "Yeah, I got this." And I was second again, so two times second in row. Small mistake, small, 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 small details and. Um, points uh, and then basically i became second again i was like i'm gonna give up it doesn't make sense this is just so hard but year after i somehow recovered then i realized if i'm gonna do this for last time i'm gonna do it for something bigger than my ego and trophy and winning i should do it for like bigger picture and basically showing the people that you shouldn't give up you should follow your dreams and kind of try to do the best coffee cocktail ever and uh, and then i did it it was in budapest in hungary 2017 I became world champion after seven years with the highest scores ever in history. And that was just a week after World Class where we met. So well, within, the, I, within the week, I did World crazy. Class and World Finals. That's crazy. Um, I think it says a lot about you that you, after that second to last time, that you just said, okay, screw it. I am going to put my ego aside and pride because I'm sure I, I've seen, you know, I've been to a lot of the World Class semifinals or finals in the UK. And I've seen a lot of guys and girls try over and over again, and they never really get out of the top 10. And you see, maybe they do it twice or three times. And then they're like, I can't do it anymore. You know, I'm not going to put my, my pride on the line. And I think that, that it takes a lot to say, okay, this is going to be my seventh darn time. And I'm just going to do it again. And see, I think you, you showed a lot of um, courage doing that really. Yeah, I feel revealed, but because uh, if you hadn't won it, you would have lost again, and you you know that's can be tough the seventh time. Yeah, uh, you know, like Eric told me once. I remember that when I was about to compete, he said, "Remember, it's not about when you win, but what you'll do after that. You know, it's about what is after winning. You know, how you're gonna how you're gonna." you know, take advantage of the winning, what you're going to do with it, you know, like that's exactly what he did after world class and Conod and Sawa and all the things came. And I still remember that. I'm always telling everyone, doesn't matter if you're best in your country and if you're winning this or that competition, you have to be the best for your guests. You have to take advantage of your knowledge, of your skills, of your accolades and turn them into the full bar of happy guests, returning guests. And, and then if you want, you can share your knowledge and wisdom with your colleagues, with your peers. And that's for me, the real world champion, the one who can like share this with, 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 uh, you know, with the guests. And that's very important. 
Now, after you won that, did you think, okay, this, I really want to pursue this. Did you take that and decide that's when I'm going to leave the Savoy and do something completely different? Uh, the leaving of Savoy wasn't connected as much with winning this coffee award. Yes, that's true. That year we won Tells the Cocktail Best Bar Team. We won 50 Best, number one. I did World Class Top 10. And that competition, it was, yeah, as I said, it was most successful year, 2017. And funny enough, you know, you're waiting all your life to be on top of the game, you know, and uh, you're waiting for that moment. And it happened. And I wasn't happy. Mm. And then I was like questioning myself, you know, like what you really want? What's the happiness? You know, like you achieved everything, you know, you're in position where everyone wants to be there, you know, in your shoes and you're not happy. Why is that? You know? One of the problems was London itself, the life, you know, the social life I had there. I didn't have a time for my partner. To be honest, we weren't together at all. And uh, you know that there's the pressure and the social life and the weather and everything. You know, London wasn't city for me for the happiness. And lucky enough, I had opportunity to go to Australia for a small work trip. And uh, we did Melbourne, we did Sydney, we did a couple of guest shifts as a, as a Savoy. And... Uh, and I look at everyone there. Everyone was happy. Everyone was smiling. Everyone was relaxed. You know, it was sunny. And I met a couple of people who work in London previously. People who work at Artesian. They work at the Connaught, etc. The similar, similar, you know, if not the same establishment where I was working. And they were like, oh, we are much happier. Everything is better here. I was like, wow, what's going on? And then I remember when, uh, when I got back in December 2017, I was like, hold on. You achieved everything and you're not happy what is real happiness and my girlfriend she was telling me she was like well maybe happiness is is just having good life outside of work maybe we should move to australia but you know to get visa to australia it take a while and it took exactly like six seven months so when i left the savoy in march 4th of march 2018 so over three years and i had my last drink there which was moonwalk the same drink i had when i walk in uh i said to myself maybe i should take advantage of it and uh, do some travels. And uh, yeah, I travel around the world, probably 25 countries. I uh, did seminars about coffee and cocktails and hospitality focus. And I tried to share some knowledge. And of course, like I won't lie to you, you know, it was a well paid job. You know, you go to Costa Rica, you go to Japan, you go to Chicago, uh, Lebanon, Rome. You know, it's well paid. You can bring your partner with you in some trips, you can earn some extra money. And at the same time, thinking about the future, what you want to do in Australia. And that beautiful gap. You know, allows me to to think about future and kind of set the priorities. And priority number one was to be happy. That's what mattered the most. And when you got to Sydney, when you decided, when you moved permanently, did you know what you wanted to do when you got there? Do you have any plans yet? Yeah, I was I was already by then approached by uh, by by guys who were running an amazing uh, restaurant called Maybe Frank which is an Italian coffee cocktail bar or cocktail restaurant bar. And the guys were uh, three years in a row, top 10 best international restaurant cocktail bar, Tales of the Cocktails. They were doing well, well. Bar was led by Andrea Gualdi, ex-member of Artesian. He, he won a world class uh, for Australia. He went to Mexico, became the third in the world that year. And he was very successful. And they started gaining more and more attention and uh, accolades. And uh, they said, like, well, if you come to Australia, we should do something together. We should open a proper cocktail bar, something like in London, but without all that fuss and rules and, you know, bullshit and money and corporate. So we had this idea and uh, we were working already at that time on something else that maybe Frank, which is Frank Sinatra. And we had this idea open uh, maybe Semi, inspired by Semi Davis Jr. So yes, when I moved to Australia in July 2018, we already knew what we we're going to do and how we we're going to do it. And it took us more than six months to execute it and open the door in January 2019. When you said proper cocktail bar in Sydney, don't there there was no other proper cocktail bar in Sydney? It, don't get me wrong. The bars here are amazing. They're doing amazing drinks and service. And uh, hospitality is way different here than in Europe. We, we were thinking about proper bar something what we were, uh, ex we were experiencing back in London, something where we were okay. being tra trained to, to deliver and, uh, you know, like we had Andrea and Balash from Artesian, me from Savoy. We got a girl from Connaught. She was working with Agon for three years. I got guy from Hawksmoor Spitafield. And uh, I got an uh, ex guy from uh, Salvatore Calabrese Playboy Club. So all my team, Londoners from like restaurants, you know, clubs, hotel bars. And we had this idea to, to open a bar which going to be like London in terms of the service, sequence of service okay. and hospitality. 
and much more relaxed in terms of the cocktails and kind of ambience and atmosphere. So I'm not saying Australia doesn't have a good bars. I have many favorite bars here, but we had this vision to bring a bit of class, I would say. Okay, I guess bringing that London feel to there. I, I wasn't meaning at all that there weren't good cocktail yeah, parts yeah, in yeah. Australia. We know that there are fabulous ones. And actually, you, I, I've seen some of your photos from maybe Sammy. And what makes me laugh is there you are, you've moved all the way to Australia and you're wearing your white jacket, okay? And it looks like you could be in the Savoy, except for one thing, your beard. Yeah, The beard, the yeah. beard is it. And I thought, oh, he went all the way there. And it's really to be able to sport that beard and that bring that kind of casual feel to, you know, that kind of cocktail yeah. bar. It is still me when I'm at Sammy and when, when I'm working at Sammy, Although I look like I'm back at the Savoy, it's still it's still me, but it's much more relaxed. I'm much more open and much more, you know, I'm not on the chains anymore. Like at the Savoy, I could do things I want to do, but sometimes I was like, oops, be careful, you shouldn't do this and that well, because it, of the rules. It's the Savoy, the Savoy. The Savoy. It is the yeah. Savoy. So the semi-difference is, yes, I have a beard, and the one difference you're going to see when you'll come to visit us, our jacket is actually pink. Ah, it's I didn't see pink. that in the picture. Yeah, it's very light pink salmon color. It's a linen, <gasps> so it's very light and airy, something what you need for a Sydney uh, weather. And uh, yeah, people having this feeling, oh my God, this is like Savoy, you know, like marble everywhere. And like, it's like so, you know, like posh. But then uh, you see us running with the bubble guns around and playing uh, rock and roll and fun music and dancing on top of the bar. Like, that's what makes difference. And probably more importantly for you, there are lots of coffee cocktails on the menu. Oh my God! Australia is a dream country for that. It's 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 not the it's not the joke anymore. You know when people saying Australian are obsessed with coffee, like number one best selling cocktail, not coffee cocktail, but cocktail is espresso martini. It's just mental. They love coffee and they can drink coffee any time of the day. Of course, of course. And so, tell me about your co kind of your your coffee growth from what you did or didn't do at the Savoy to what you're able to do at maybe Sammy. Or yeah, in Australia. Yeah, I, maybe semi. I had a full freedom to do whatever I want. So my my partners ever trusted me from beginning. So I could bring the coffee knowledge and craft an idea on the table without any fuss. So I'm in charge of the coffee program. So that means I'm sourcing coffee from the farms. I'm roasting coffee by myself, and I'm creating coffee cocktails and coffee on its own in our bars. So I'm in charge of everything in terms of coffee. Uh, I can do what I want. And finally, I can you know, put my hands in dirt and roast it and go so deep into that. And of course, apart from maybe Sammy, the Mr. Black came on board and that kind of just escalated uh, very quickly and brought the coffee topic into my life even more. Well, I've known about Mr. Black for a while because I interviewed a while ago um, someone who worked with Mr. Black. and uh, But that's about three and a half years ago. Um, did you know them and work with them while you were at the Savoy? Yeah, like we had this friendship, you know, I remember when they brought the bottle for the first time, I was like, oh my God, another coffee liquor, it's going to be sweet, it's going to be artificial, uh, but uh, I tasted it, I was like, wow, that's bloody delicious, what's that, I became curious, and uh, I had a good relationship with owner, with Tom Baker, and that's why I went for a trip to Australia in 2017, I was like, well, we're going to invite you to the Savoy, you're going to do coffee cocktails, and we had this relationship, I was just like, fan, you know, fanboy, I loved it, you know. So when I moved to Australia, I was like, well, listen, you're already doing what we are doing. You're traveling around the world, preaching about coffee and cocktails. You are the bridge between the world of coffee and cocktails. And we're doing the same. Why, we, why don't we do it together? Here's the offer on the table. We never did this before. Would you like to be our global coffee ambassador? I was like, all right, of course. Yeah, <laughs> it's a brand I believe in. It's something what I love to do. And, uh, and it's almost two years now. Um, now, are you going around the world with Mr. Black and teaching people about uh, yeah. their the cure that way? Yeah. So my role is uh, opening new markets, doing trainings, tasting seminars, guest shifts, attending big conferences and festivals. And basically, I'm not a brand ambassador. I'm a coffee ambassador. So it's more about knowledge. It's more about the preaching about uh, the coffee cocktail importance and coffee importance rather than just coming to your bar and be like, oh, you should buy this bottle and, you know, stuff like that. But I heard a rumor that you are actually starting your own little coffee pods. Oh, that's true. I had them here with me. Yeah. Here. <laughs> wow, you're good. You are a spy. Tell me a little bit about the coffee pods. 
So the idea was very simple. Uh, whenever I went around the world, doesn't matter if it was Savoy or maybe Semi or Mr. Black, whenever I went around the world, you know, I was telling everybody how coffee liquors are important in espresso martini, you know, how you should this and that. And then in the end of the day, they didn't have a good coffee behind the bar because most of the cocktail bars, they're focusing on eyes and rotovabs and homemade ingredients and techniques and tools. And they're forgetting about coffee, you know, they're taking it for granted. And I was so, so upset about it, you know, like, oh my God, I'm drinking the best coffee liquor, you know, and uh, you don't have a good coffee. Like, what can I do? So then I was thinking, what's the biggest issue in cocktail bars nowadays? It's a speed, you know, we have to be fast when we do drinks, okay? Then it's a, 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 the money problem, you know, the budgeting. You don't have the money to buy a big coffee machine, which costs 15,000 pounds. And third thing, it's a space. You know, you don't have a space for a machine, but you still want to do decent coffee cocktails. So I was like, what can I do for those people out there, for all my friends, to be able to deliver fast, consistent, and the most tastiest espresso ever? And that's where coffee capsules came, uh, came in my mind. Of course, there are a couple of brands around the world, but they're more commercial, and I'm not going to name them. You know, George Clooney very well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I had the idea, if he can do it, why I cannot do it? You know, I'm like world coffee champion, da, da, da. So uh, uh, the idea came up into my mind when I was in, <laughs> I was in Thailand, in the north of the Thailand, in Chiang Mai. I was doing some small event with the, with the coffee guys over there. And I had the massage, which was very cheap. It was like two hours intense massage of my head. And I got like in kind of like deep, deep kind of like, I don't know, nirvana meditation state when I was starting to think about coffee and cocktails and spirituality and kind of emotions. And I came up with the idea to create a brand spiritual coffee. Okay. So as a spirit, as a coffee, but being ritual at the same time. And uh, I think I want to, I want to preach about the importance of coffee and cocktails, but it kind of the spiritual uh, way where we appreciate everything. And, and I create this uh, beautiful coffee pots, here is even written, make it alive if you're going to see it online. So make me alive. That's kind of my main motto. Uh, you know, we're drinking coffee every day to wake up, to kind of give us caffeine and, you know, to make our day. And it's something that would really make us alive, you know. That's why we're waking up every day. And, uh, and that's, my, uh, that's my kind of idea, to bring her pots to the bars. And I understand environmental impact. So they are recyclable at the moment, working on a biogradable version as well. The coffee is selected by me, roasted by me. It's, it's preserved with nitrogen, so there's amazing shelf life. And, of course, I'm going to do coffee beans, regular beans, if you want to. But I think coffee pots, uh, that's the future. Because the biggest problem of good coffee or specialty coffee is the distance between us professionals and regular people out there at home. I want my mom having the same cup of coffee as I'm having when I'm in a bar or at home. I want to bridge that gap, and I want to show the people that having a good coffee today is not as hard as begging time and uh, I want to make it more approachable. I love that. I want to drink your coffee. <laughs> Easy, All send right? me your address. Send me your address. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fantastic. Well, in fact, now I want a coffee. I know it's not going to be as good as yours, but um, so I'm going to bid you adieu from um, London and thank you so much for being on the show. Absolutely. It was a pleasure. It was all mine. And I cannot wait to see you in Australia. And thank you all for listening. Take care. Be happy and positive. And uh, hopefully we're going to have a party soon. I hope so, too. We will, definitely. Thank you. We got talking about bars. And of course, I had to ask him what his favorite bars around the world were. Other than maybe Sammy, what is your favorite bar in Australia? And I'm not going to give you an answer like everyone else. Oh, the favorite bar is where I feel welcome and they greet me with a smile. Yes, yes, that's true. Okay. I'm going to give you real names. And I can give you even favorite bars around the world if you want. My okay, favorite... give me a couple. Okay. So I have a, I give you four, my, my, my favorite bars in the world. Yeah. Four, top four. Okay. Number one, El Copitas from St. Petersburg in Russia. Okay. It's a speakeasy, mescaleria, tequila bar in the basement. Super illegal, amazing people, amazing marketing. I had one of the best guest shifts there. Absolutely love Russia. And Russia is so underestimated at the moment. It's not on the radar as it should be. So El Copita is number one. Number two will be a uh, in Tokyo, in Japan, in Ginza, 
And it's none of those bars you think, like the famous one, which are amazing, but it's a very small, tiny bar in the basement called Apollo Bar. And Apollo Bar is famous for only one drink, and that's a whiskey highball. And uh, they drink only whiskey highballs the best way possible. You know, they have this hand fan where they're diluting ice, they're doing diamonds, carbonate on soda. So that's Apollo Bar, number two. Number three, my favorite bar is Australian Bar. It's in the Gold Coast, okay? And it's a tiny bar called Rosella. And it's they having only Australian ingredients, nothing else. Only Australian spirits, only Australian food, Jaffa's, which is like a toasty. And uh, they're super cool guys. It's close to the beach. I really, really love them. That's number three. Uh, and then number four, uh, I think I forgot. <laughs> I Every know. other bar in the world. Yeah, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> which one? Okay. Oh yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Of course. Um, my sorry to interrupt, but my uh, fiance Michelle she just said, "Oh yeah, you forgot to mention Dante." Well, yeah, Dante is our favorite, but he was even a favorite before they became, you know, number one or famous. Before I even knew Naren, and uh, and uh, yes, we we loved it every time we were in New York. We were going there, but it's it's obvious, you know, it's number one. <laughs> Martin has given us two fantastic Mister Black cocktails of the week. One slightly easier to make at home, and the other not hard, but you need a few ingredients that you might not have around the house right now. Here he is to tell us how to make the Mr. Black Espresso Martini. All right. Now, I, I just don't want to say that because I work for Mr. Black, but Mr. Black essentially is a vodka-based spirit, okay? We're using Australian vodka, so vodka is inside, okay? You have a vodka. Sugar is inside, but it's half less sugar than anything else. So it's still healthy. It's not that, you know, sugar and sweet. And the real coffee is inside, okay? If you think about DNA of espresso martini, vodka, sugar, coffee, basically you have espresso martini in a bottle. If you are able to grab espresso from next door, or if you have an espresso machine at home, take one part of espresso, two parts of Mr. Black, shake it hard, and you're going to have the most delicious and simplest espresso martini ever. For the Mr. Black Espresso Martini, all you need are 60 mils of Mr. Black and 30 mils of espresso. Combine the ingredients in a shaker with ice, then shake it hard and strain into a coupe glass. The second cocktail of the week is no less delicious. It's called La Finca, due to its important Spanish ingredient. Add the following to a mixing glass. 30 mils of Mr. Black, 20 mils of Oloroso Sherry, and 10 mils of Manuka Honey Syrup. You can make that with two parts honey to one part water. Stir, and then strain into a rocks glass and garnish with a dried or fresh fig. You can find this recipe, more classic recipes, and all the cocktails of the week at alushlifemanual.com, where you'll find links to all the ingredients. I don't know if anyone has gandered past my Instagram page lately, but I have designated myself the hashtag reluctant bartender. It is not a role I have ever wanted, as there are so many I know who do it so much better than I, and I miss them right now. I raise a glass to them every time I try and make a cocktail at home. If you live for Lush Life, make sure you're giving back to the bars you love by donating to them or taking part in cocktail delivery where you live. Theme music for Lush Life is by Stephen Shapiro and used with permission. And Lush Life is always and will be forever produced by Evo Terra and Simpler Media Productions. Which leaves me to say the wise words of Oscar Wilde, all things in moderation, including moderation, and always drink responsibly and wash your hands and stay safe. Okay, the second part was mine. Next week, meet our guest, whom I, whom I met when we were both taking the WSET Level 2 class in spirits. He definitely had the hometown advantage when it came to acing the test, since he was already a bartender at the Connaught. Until that time, bottoms up.